Hello, welcome to the latest EDU webinar on um, dental legal aspects of uh, remote consultations. Um, this evening, what we're going to be doing is discussing the dental legal considerations when providing remote consultations. So we're hoping to demonstrate the importance of consent, confidentiality and record keeping when consulting remotely and highlight the role of administrative systems and procedures prior to conducting a remote consultation. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm Leo Briggs. I'm Deputy Head of the DDU. I qualified as a dentist in 1989. I've worked in general dental practice and community. I've got a master's degree in perio and I'm on the specialist list for periodontics. I started at the DDU in 2005, initially part-time. I went full-time in 2009 and then I became Deputy Head in 2016. Um, with questions, um, jot them down, put them on the um, questions part of the um, of the um, webinar um, and send them in along the way. It's going to be much easier for us to get through as many questions as possible at the end if you send them to us as we're going rather than trying to write them all at the end. Um, and we'll answer the questions as many as we can at the end. Um, we were thinking when we were setting this up, things that people might be concerned about, um, and they were consent, confidentiality, contemporaneous records, communication, continuity of care, assessment, and indemnity. And we asked people beforehand, what were their concerns? Now, the results were really interesting. The ability to be able to assess the patient was the biggest concern, and also indemnity was a concern. Um, the others were lower. Um, so what we're going to try and do this evening is um, explain about how to set about making sure that you can adequately assess a patient uh, when you are doing remote consultations. And get the basics right. Work out which patients might be able to be consulted remotely. There may be a number of patients who it's not appropriate to do have an agreed criteria before you start remote consultations or start to look at it again for which patients are appropriate to consult remotely, what level of remote consultation you're going to do, and then when you need to see them face to face. And this will help you in your planning of how you assess the patients. Um, can you do it safely? That should always be the, the first thing that you think about, how can I do this safely? How can I do it safely for patients? How can I do it safely for me? And then do you have the right facilities for the remote access that you are going to be um, carrying out? Um, there are three basic types of remote consultations that you can do. There's telephone, there's video, and then there's online apps. Um, so chat type, um, apps that can be used. Um, so I'd like to do a poll now. Um, it's not mandatory for you to uh, take part in this poll. Um, it is voluntary. Um, the results might be used in future uh, DDU um, communications, but it would be really great if all of you could take part in this poll and just answer this question. Since the beginning of the pandemic, what remote consultations have increased within your workplace? And you can tick all that apply. Um, so we'll leave the poll open for a few more seconds. Um, so yes, the, the results coming in. Yes, a few more still coming in. So I think we'll close the uh, poll now. Um, so there. And that's, that's interesting looking at the results. Um, telephone has increased enormously online not much, and, and video a, a, a bit more than the online triaging systems. Um, that's not a surprise. The telephone triage um, has um, boomed uh, during uh, the first lockdown, and it's probably here to stay. Uh, but the video consultations would be similar to the telephone ones. Um, online, the chat systems, I think, um, are a bit more difficult for um, consultations. Um, so um, we'll, we'll talk about that later as well. So how is a remote consultation different from a face-to-face -face one? It's basically the same, but slightly different. 
Um, and you have the limited or no visual clues. Obviously, if you're doing it by phone, you have no visual clues at all. You don't get that feedback from the patient about how they're looking, uh, their body language, all those things. You don't get any smells, um, which can sometimes be a little bit of an advantage, but also a disadvantage. There are things that you are not picking up. You don't get any tactile clues, so you cannot do any sort of uh, physical examination. Um, and also just how people talk to each other is different. Um, putting on the phone voice, um, are you picking up on all those other cues that you normally do during a face-to-face -face consultation? And then do you know who else is around? Um, are there other people in the room for the patient that you can't see so they don't want to give you information? I'm sure loads of people have um, seen a patient before, asked if anything's changed in their medical history. They've sort of hidden from the kids and said that they're pregnant. If the children are in the room, they might not want them to hear things. So you might not get those sorts of cues and that information from patients. So it's just being aware of that and planning that into how you carry out your consultations that's important. So just be thinking about those things. Think about how you're going to structure your phone call and your video consultation. So always think about the beginning, the middle, the end. You know, how are you going to introduce yourself? Um, how are you going to exchange information? How are you going to end it? Um, it's exactly the same as a face-to-face -face consultation. We all get used to which patients we can bring in, how we can get them to sit in the chair and stop them talking. And then, so it's the beginning, the middle, the end. Um, but it's thinking about that with your remote consultations um, and think about that beforehand, plan ha your action uh, before you start doing them. The introduction, it's important that you let people know who you are. Um, they may well know you, but just reintroduce yourself, especially if you're doing it by phone, um, especially if you've never seen them before. Um, set out what the call is for, what the consultation is for, and clarify at the beginning. Um, if you're an administrator, you're doing the triaging, let patients know that. Let them know that they are not talking to a clinician. If you're the clinician, let them know that. Um, really important. It sounds so simple and basic, but it's incredibly important. Um, information exchange, you know, use the open questions as you would normally. Listen carefully. And think about how you can listen. You need to be somewhere where you can hear well. Um, if you are doing a telephone consultation, think about having a headset, having hands-free, um, so that, that you, you can just listen a bit more carefully and you're not having to hold onto the phone. Um, so all of those things, do your active listening um, and then your critical thinking. Does this all add up? Um, so, and if not, do I need to get some more questions? Um, so just be thinking it through as you're going through. And then the closure, you know, check at the end that, that what you had planned to do has been met. Summarize, check, sort out the next phases, right? I think it's best that this is face to face or you can wait for another few months, that's okay, but if there's any problems, get back in touch immediately. Let people know how to do that and build in the safety netting. Let people always know what to do if something changes. So make sure that that's part of your standard procedure when you're doing any sort of remote consultation. Um, and then video consulting, uh, the basics, you know, dress professionally, think about how you look. Loads of patients will be assuming that you are in the surgery when you are consulting them, um, whether that is um, uh, by phone or um, by video. So just think about how you want to appear to them. Think about the lighting. Um, my colleagues who will see you later will be laughing at the moment because I was dashing around earlier, switching on lights, switching off lights because it just wasn't working. Um, Think about the background. Um, I know my one's 
very cluttered, um, but it might be better to have a plain wall. Um, think about the clear desk, make sure that people cannot see things that they should not see. So look at what your camera can show and then avoid interruptions. Doors shut, locked, make sure that people who shouldn't be coming in can't come in. Um, interruptions in the surgery, um, patients might be used to, and they will see that the people coming in are clinicians, so that it's not so bad. Um, if you are doing remote consultations, they might not realize who it is who's coming in, and so you might not get good information out of the patient. Um, with the security and the confidentiality, ensure that video conferencing software is approved. Um, check and turn off default recording settings um, because you should only record if the patient has given you consent to do so. Use secure internet access, password protected devices. Don't store information on your own devices. Um, turn off uh, virtual assistance and uh, disable sharing across devices and clouds. So just get those basics right as well. Eye contact, think about where your camera is. Um, have the camera directly above um, where your screen is um, if you're looking at a screen. Um, best not to have a side screen that you keep on turning to um, because if you do that, it is very distracting for people. Um, so make sure that you are looking at the camera and that you are talking to the patient. Assume that the camera is the patient's face and then um, you'll get it right. Um, and then also, if you need to make some notes, just let someone know that you're going to do that because they'll suddenly hear the clattering. Um, you can make notes um, while you're looking at the camera as well, if you can type that way, uh, but you might need to say, look, I, I just need to make some notes, so I'm going to be looking away from the camera, um, just so they know what's happening. And then think beforehand, does the patient know what to expect? Have you prepared them for what's going to happen? Um, and also those things about how quickly you'll be able to get in touch with them and what to do if they need urgent attention. Um, and then get someone, get a, get, have a practice, see what it's like from the patient's perspective using the software that you're using, see how it looks to the other person um, and just try it out beforehand so that you know what they can see. Um, when you're consulting with those under 16, find out who is present. Um, an adult should usually be present. Make a note of who it is. Um, does the adult have parental responsibility? If not, why? Um, it may well have been delegated for there to be another adult there. Um, request from child, young person to speak in the absence of the parent. You've got to think about whether they have the capacity. Are there any safeguarding issues? And just have a low threshold for a face-to-face -face assessment. Um, obviously, older, under 16s, um, you'll be thinking slightly differently, but the younger the child, the more, you, more of these things will be to the fore of your mind. And then, if there are any third parties present, clarify, document who's present and um, whether they were with um, the person or whether they were joining remotely. Um, clarify why they're joining. Um, if you want someone else to come in, get consent beforehand uh, from the patient um, and then think about um, and also remember to ask the third parties to um, switch off recording devices um, or to leave them out of the consultation. Um, I'm going to move over now to my colleague Sarah Ide, who's um, going to cover confidentiality with you. Hello, thanks Leo. Just a quick bit about me. Um, I qualified from Guy's in 1992. I worked there as a house officer before going into practice as a VT. I was in general practice for 25 years. I completed an MSc in aesthetic dentistry. Um, I started working at the DDU five years ago, combining it with general practice, but now I work here full time. And we're going to start with a poll, um, which I think is going to be opened now. And we're going to ask you, um, where it is that you're carrying out your remote consultations. Are you carrying them out from home or the workplace 
or, or both. And obviously earlier on, you were saying that you were doing quite a lot of telephone consultations. Just be interesting for us to know where you're carrying them out from. So I'll just give you a bit of a chance to, to answer that. And we can see the results are coming in. And I think we can probably close that now. And it seems that um, most of you are doing your consultations at, at work, which of course is probably in line with the fact that we're all back in the surgery now um, after the um, lockdown period. All right, so I'm going to talk about confidential information in dentistry in general terms. And here's some of the information which must be kept confidential. In summary, any and all information you come to know about a patient in the course of your professional relationship with them must be treated as confidential, even information about their holidays or their family, and remember that the duty of confidentiality extends to information beyond the clinical records. It includes all correspondence between you and the patient, including emails, recorded consultations, telephone conversations, appointment details, and of course, financial information. And so it's important that computer screens with patient information on shouldn't be visible to anyone other than members of the dental team. So if you're planning reception areas and surgeries, um, try to plan them so that confidential matters can be discussed and can't be overheard. And this applies to telephone or video calls as well as face-to-face -face conversations. And if you're carrying out video consultations from home, the same principles apply. You may want to position yourself in a corner of the room without a computer generated backdrop so the patient can be reassured that their consultation is being conducted in an appropriate setting. You'll obviously need to organise what's visible in the background if it, so that it looks professional, especially if you're homeschooling. All right, so although the legal, professional and contractual obligations of confidentiality are, are interlinked, it can be helpful to separate them out when trying to understand our overarching obligation to maintain confidentiality. So the legal duty of confidentiality, there is a difference between common law and statute law. Statute law is legislation which has been passed by parliament. Whenever you hear about a statutory obligation, it means it's arisen from a requirement set out in an act of parliament. And case law evolves and develops as judges decide how issues should be dealt with. And Alison's going to cover some of the case law that applies to consent later on. An example where case law has impacted on confidentiality is the issue of Gillick competence. I know this is also tied in with consent, but the issue that was grappled with by the courts was the right of a child under the age of 16 to have details about the use of a contraceptive medication kept confidential. And of course, the final outcome of this lengthy process was that if a child is competent to make a decision, the parent doesn't have the right to be informed unless the child wants them to be. So some of the legislation that dental professionals need to be aware of are the Health and Social Care Act 2008 and the Human Rights Act 1998. I think the most important legislation for us as dental professionals to be aware of is the Data Protection Act 2018. This replaced the 1998 Data Protection Act and incorporates the general data protection regulations, which have tightened up existing protections for all of us. But it does mean that our systems and procedures in the workplace need to be compliant with these regulations. Our professional duty of confidentiality is set out in GDC Standard 4, which states, you must protect the confidentiality of patient information and only use it for the purpose of which it was given. So this means that if a patient gives information for a certain reason, it can't be used for another purpose without their consent. If you use an email address to send marketing information, for example, make sure you have the consent of the patient to use it for this purpose. And the same will go for clinical photographs. You can't use photographs which were taken as part of the records for any other purpose unless the patient agrees to them being used and a breach of confidentiality could result in a complaint or an investigation. Um, now, running on to contractual duties of confidentiality, within the dental practice, all staff should be made aware of their responsibilities to maintain confidentiality and how to manage data. And it's very important that non-registrants and trainee members of the dental team are also aware of their duty. So your practice induction and ongoing training program should include training in this area and staff contracts should include a confidentiality clause. OK, so GDPR, we're talking about data controllers. So GDPR sets out the difference between the roles and responsibilities of data controllers and data processors. 
it's the data controller that must have overall control of the data. So it should be involved in making decisions, including the release of any data from the practice, for example, overseeing the release of patient records. And in dental practices, the data, the data controller is usually the practice principal and all the other staff are usually data processors. We are aware that sometimes principals want all self-employed associates, hygienists and therapists to register as data controllers, but we advise that you do not do this unless you are a data controller, because you'll be responsible in the law for information you do not have control over. So if you're making clinical notes, updating medical histories, or making any other changes to the records, you're a data processor, even if you're accessing practice IT systems and information remotely. If you use your personal computer or devices from home, you should check with the data controller to confirm that you're simply processing data. I'm now gonna pass over to my colleague, Alison. Thank you, Sarah. Now, before I talk to you about consent during remote con consultations, I would just like to introduce myself. My name's Alison Large, and I'm one of the Dento Legal Advisors here at the DDU. I qualified from Newcastle University and after that spent time working in general practice. During that time, I worked as a VT trainer, which is now known as an educational supervisor, and I joined the DDU in 2008. I initially started working part time in practice and undertaking uh, this role, um, and I now work full time as a dento legal advisor. So I'm going to speak to you about consent, but before I go on to uh, talk about consent during remote consultations, I just wanted to undertake another poll to find out how you feel you've been managing in terms of gaining consent during remote consultations. Now, this poll, um, if we can get it started now, um, is a simple yes or no poll. Have you been finding it more difficult to obtain consent during remote consultations? So that poll has started now. So I'll just give you a little bit of time to um, answer that question. Obviously, it's a straightforward uh, yes or no response. I'll give that a few more moments. I think that we've got most responses in now. So if we can close that poll now, we should have the results. So it's very close. Um, 52 of you have said that you are finding it more difficult to undertake, um, obtain consent during a remote consultation. And certainly during the pandemic, we found that many of our members have spoken to us about concerns about obtaining consent. So it obviously is an issue that does crop up. At the DDU, we're aware that patients being involved in the consent process can mean that they're less likely to litigate. And interestingly, this is even in circumstances where the outcome's not ideal. So ensuring that a joint decision-making process is taken during that remote consultation is absolutely key. So although undertaking uh, a consent process during a consultation remotely may have more hurdles, the three principles of consent should still remain the foundation of your consultation. Firstly, need to think about competency you need to establish if the patient themselves can consent to the remote consultation and the way in which it's going to be conducted. So Leo spoke about children before, it may be that children need to have an adult with them. If you have an adult patient and you consider that the adult can't give consent to the consultation, you need to consider whether it's appropriate to involve someone else. There may be situations where you decide in actual fact, you do need a remote, uh, you need to move from a remote consultation to a face-to-face -face consultation. And if this happens, keep a record of the reasons you reach, that made you reach this decision. The second key part is making sure that you have sufficient 
the patients have sufficient information. Um, and providing patients with information may be far more challenging without being able to use your usual supporting materials. Routinely, when I was in practice, I often used models, pictures, images, leaflets to help with that consent process. And if you would normally rely on these when you're obtaining consent, you may have to think of a way to overcome the issue of your dealing with it remotely. It may be as simple as being able to send the patient some information by email. The next part of ensuring you have consent is making sure the patient is voluntarily agreeing to your proposals. The patient needs to be willing to agree to the process and importantly not feel pressured. Usually this would involve giving patient time to consider their decision. If consent's being obtained remotely, satisfying yourself that it's been obtained may be far more difficult when you're not actually dealing with the patient face to face. As Leo talked about, you don't have all those visual cues to allow you to be satisfied that the patient is indeed entirely happy. So historically, medical ethics did not focus on the patient's agreement to the procedure. A patient being involved in their decision-making process is a concept adopted in the 20th century. And before this, it would be for the treating clinician to make the decision. And this was known as medical paternalism. The concept of ensuring the patient is the center of the decision-making process was the focus of a number of landmark legal decisions in the 1990s in countries such as the USA, Canada and Australia. This moved the law in these countries towards the approach of patient autonomy. Despite this, I'm sure you've been in a situation where some patients suggest that you make the decision for them. Or you may have heard patients say something along the lines of, do what you think's best or what would you do? Whilst patients, of course, will need your guidance as their treating dental professional, you ultimately need to be consent, content sorry, that the patient's agreement to the uh, proposed approach has been achieved. As a result of the Montgomery judgment, it's now essential that the patient is provided with enough information about the risks that they would attach an importance to. And this is even in circumstances where we may consider that there is a low likelihood of this risk occurring. So some practical tips to obtaining valid consent include making sure that you've discussed all the alternatives. And this includes the option of doing nothing. We're aware that many remote consultations or triage consultations may take place when a patient is in pain. However, doing nothing may still be an option. Although we may consider this unlikely, there may be a personal circumstances that may influence that patient's particular decision. You may not need to mention all the pros and cons of every single option in every case. In particular, if it's been agreed with the patient that something isn't a, a suitable option for that patient or it, it's not a viable way forwards, then this may not be necessary. However, the patient can expect to be provided with the advantages and disadvantages of the chosen course of action the information provided should be considered reasonable to a person in the patient's position. For example, during the pandemic, a factor that may be taken into consideration are the risks to the patient of traveling to the practice and attending the surgery. This needs to be weighed up against the benefits of the patient being seen in person, receiving treatment or not delaying a beneficial intervention. And these are no doubt the types of careful balancing decisions that, that you're making with your patients regularly. And we would recommend 
recording the rationale behind the decision being made. Explaining carefully any limitations associated with the treatment that you are providing is also important. Again, this may be be particularly relevant during the pandemic and try to manage the patient's expectations when they come to the practice. The patient may need to be advised of any time delays or limitations in the treatment. And this is both at the practice or if you're needing to make an onward referral for the patient. Full notes of the consent process during the remote consultation should be made. And this should be equivalent to the records that you would make during a face-to-face -face consultation. The patient's agreement to your consultation in the first instance, your clinical findings, discussions, options given, and the treatment approach decided upon should all be contained within your records. It may be that there are facilities to allow you to record the telephone call or the video consultation itself. To do this, you'd need to have the patient's agreement and the recording needs to be stored as part of the patient's clinical records. So again, you need to ensure that you have the patient's consent to do that. If any treatment is declined, it can be helpful to record in the records the reasons for this, why the patient has declined it, and also document any advice provided to the patient associated with the patient's decision not to go ahead with treatment. Remember that that consent is an ongoing two-way discussion with the patient, and primarily this is the process that you want to record in your records. A consent form is simply a document that shows that the process took place at a point in time, it does not replace that need to have the discussion with the patient. I would also like to make a quick mention here of auto notes. And please be very careful if you are using them. They are immensely helpful, immensely time consuming, sorry, immensely helpful and, 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 and reduce time consuming entries in the records. But you need to make sure that the entry that then goes into your records is absolutely correct. As Dento legal advisors, we've often seen occasions where there's notes relating to the patient being warned about the risk of an oral antral communication or a root fragment being displaced into the sinus. And this may be recorded when a lower tooth is being removed. Unfortunately, irrelevant entries within your records could undermine the perceived accuracy of the rest of the very detailed record that you've made about the consent process. So please just be aware of this. So focusing on the individual patient is key, as was highlighted by the Montgomery judgment. The consent process should be tailored to your individual patient. And this is very relevant to any remote consultations. It's important to ensure that you've understood the patient's individual circumstances. So the options that you discuss are correct for them. The patient's circumstances will no doubt be important when assessing the patient prior to face-to-face -face consultation. Asking patients if they have COVID symptoms, if they have a recent positive COVID test result, if they're shielding uh, or undertaking a period of isolation or quarantine, these are the type of questions that you no doubt have become routine as part of your initial patient assessment process. And remember, it's that two-way conversation with the patient that is key to involving the patient in their decision-making process. At the end of your remote consultation, it can be helpful to ask the patient to relay back to you the information you've provided them with. And this is so you can satisfy yourself that it has been understood. You would wish to be certain that patient knows what's going to happen next. For example, arrangements for the provision of any medications, collecting prescriptions, if they're going to be seen face to face, the arrangements for this or who will be contacting them next. If they're expected to call you back 
or um, if you're arranging a follow-up review of, of, of any issues that they have, really important that they understand what's happening next. And this way you can manage their expectations. This may also include being really clear about any timeframes. Don't forget at the end of your consultation to provide that safety netting advice. That includes the next steps that the patient may need to take if they were to develop further issues. Leo is going to talk next a little bit more about recording and record keeping in respect of remote consultations. Thank you, Alison. Um, so we're on to the home straight now and no um, presentation from a defence organisation would be complete without something about record keeping. Um, going to do a poll again. So the question is, and it's a yes, no answer, do you have access to the practice record management system at the time of your remote consultation? So the poll is now open. Uh, the votes are coming in thick and fast. Um, so if you can carry on uh, voting, um, we'll leave it open just for a little bit longer. Um, yes, a few more votes coming in. That looks like that's, that, oh no, just going up a bit more. Yeah, I think that's probably about it now. So if we close the poll and there, 82% of you have access to the patient record management system at the time of your remote consultation. That has probably changed um, through the course of the pandemic. Um, probably a lot of you did not have access um, when you initially started uh, remote consultations. Um, I think it's great that you do, that the majority of you do have access because it helps iron out a load of the problems. How do you transfer information? How do you make sure that it's then placed onto the records? Um, how do you make sure other people have access to it? So what if you've done a remote consultation in one place, patient then phones up, they don't have, the, the, your colleague speaks to them, they don't have access to your records. All of those issues, if you don't have access to the practice record management system at the time of your remote consultation. So I think it's really helpful that the majority of you do. For those of you who don't, think about those other issues. How are you going to deal with the records? How are you going to get them back? How are you going to make sure that they're added to the patient's record? Um, quality records should always be legible. Uh, they should always be contemporaneous. So if you are writing them up and then forwarding them onto the practice, make sure that there's a note of when they were written and when they were then added to the record so that it's clear. Make sure that they're complete. Uh, make sure that there's an indication of who advised the patient and then use only approved abbreviations. Um, with the abbreviations, probably got a whole slew more that haven't used in the past. So AGP is probably one of them. Um, um, SOP, so Standard Operating Procedure, I didn't know what that was a year ago, do now. Um, all of these things um, are a, a abbreviations which um, make sure that everyone knows what they are so that they're approved ones in the practice. Um, and good luck trying to get them all approved because I know that whenever I use abbreviations, I know that my ones are fine. Other people might not know what they are. Um, keep up to date with the best practice guidelines. So looking at the guidelines about what should be in the records, for example, FGDP, uh, they've been giving some fantastic guidance during the pandemic um, on all sorts of issues. Uh, then there are all the specialist societies as well. Um, and so again, they can give some really helpful information to make sure that you're up to date um, with what should be recorded. Um, Note how the consultation took place. Was it by telephone? Was it by video? Um, note why it was a, a, a remote consultation. What was the reason? Note who was present. Um, document the limitations as a result of the consultation and the steps taken to address these. Um, so again, when it comes to the, the concerns about adequately being able to assess the patient, make a note of the limitations and what you have done. Um, so, and always, again, have that low threshold for thinking I need a face-to-face -face consultation. Dentistry is different to medicine. Um, with medicine, there are a lot more things that can be done remotely. In dentistry, we often have to see um, and feel 
the patient um, to work out what's going on. Could you imagine doing any sort of periodontal diagnosing without probing? So you're feeling when you're doing that, all those sorts of things. So have that low threshold for thinking, I actually do need a face-to-face -face consultation so long, as it, so long as it is safe for you and the patient. And document carefully the advice you gave, um, any follow-up arrangements that were advised. And then with the follow-up, try and make sure that it happens. I think when we do things remotely, it's slightly easier for people to fall through the net. Um, so make sure that you've got the systems and procedures in place for that follow-up to happen. If you're going to refer them, make sure that you've got the, 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 the systems in place for you to be able to refer straight away um, so that you don't, someone doesn't fall through the net. Um, sharing images, you know, um, do you need to get an image? Can a patient take a picture? It might be possible, but will the quality of the image be adequate? Um, will you be able to see the thing that you want to see, or will you just see a mass of lips and tongues? Um, it, 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 so think carefully, will it all just be a blur of saliva? Um, all of those things that we normally get rid of and control when we are doing our own examination of a patient face to face. You might be able to get some things through an image, but perhaps not everything, especially when you think that the patient is taking that image themselves. A selfie at the mouth isn't easy. Um, consent, you know, we talked about that. Uh, the specific consent is required for the image. So make sure that you've got the patient's consent for it. Make sure that they know what it's going to be used for, whether it's going to be shared. So if you're referring on, et cetera, all of those things. So that's the same as it is for a face-to-face -face consultation, but obviously it's different because you're doing it remotely. Um, capacity, um, think about whether the patient can um, consent. We've discussed that. Um, do they have the ca capacity to consent for the image being taken? Um, and then also think about how you're going to get that image. Can it be sent to you safely and securely? Um, and then how are you going to store it once you've got it? Um, using images and using video images can use up an enormous amount of um, storage space on uh, computer systems. So make sure that you've got adequate um, storage um, to deal with that. Um, and so finally, last bit, indemnity. Again, this was something which people were concerned about. Um, we know that you're consulting patients uh, by telephone and video links um, in place of usual face-to-face -face consultations, and, and you don't need to let us know that you're doing that. It is part of your uh, membership with us, so you are indemnified for doing this sort of work during the pandemic. Um, what you need to do is let us know the numbers of sessions that you are working. Um, so that's both face-to-face -face and remotely. Um, and then if you've got the adequate number of sessions on your membership, you've got adequate indemnity. You don't need to tell us specifically that you are doing remote consultations. And you can update the membership department um, on the amount of work you're doing uh, by emailing them at membership at the ddu.com. Um, so that's membership at the ddu.com um, and you'll be able to keep your membership details up to date um, that way. Um, so, um, it's time now to move on to uh, the questions. So hopefully I'll get this right and I'll stop showing the screen and my colleagues will pop up. Hopefully that's working. Right. Looks like it is. So um, any questions been coming in? Okay, Leo. So we've we've had a few questions about um, which members of the dental team can carry out remote consultations or, or triage. Right. Um, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. It, it, what needs to happen is you need to decide um, what you are consulting on remotely. Um, so um, if it is uh, triage questions, um, that can be anyone um, in the team who has been adequately and appropriately trained. They can gather the information. Um, a receptionist might not be able 
to be the best person to interpret that information so it might need to go to another clinician uh, dental nurses may well be um, able to interpret that information if you think about nhs 111 service a lot of that dental nurses provide that triaging service so it might be possible you've got to decide in your practice whether the person is um, competent to do it and has the necessary experience to do it as soon as it's any clinical decision making it needs to be a clinician who makes that decision so dentist hygienist therapist um, hygienists and therapists can do so long as it's within their scope of practice but where that can start to get a bit difficult a bit messy is if the patient's telling you you, you start off they're talking about perio and then they move into they think they've got a bit of a root filling problem so it's moved outside of the scope of practice of a hygienist or therapist in which case it then needs to have the system in place for the dentist to take over so it may well be that people can gather information it's what's done with the information that's crucial um, so yeah that's really important thank you so leo um i have a question that's come through and we've talked about um recording of consultations as part of the records but the question that's come through is about the patients recording that telephone call or um the the video call themselves Oh, right. And in particular, you know, do do they need do the patients need to be obtaining um, the consent to allow them to do that? Yeah, I mean, basically, you should ask patients not to record the consultation. Um, they can actually record it if it's for their own private use, um, but if you don't want them to. Um, make it explicit at the beginning that you don't want them to um, and explain the reason why you don't want them to record it um, so i think the important thing is again setting out the rules um, of engagement um, at the beginning of the, any consultation or ideally before the consultation is the important thing um, as i said patients do have the right to record it for personal use uh, that doesn't mean that they can then share it wherever they like um, I think anyone who had Donald Trump as a patient would have problems keeping things off Twitter, but hopefully most of your patients won't be like that. And, and of course, Leo, we, you can always say to your patients, can't you, that that because you're if if you are going to be storing it, that if they needed it to refer to, that that you can provide them access to it as well. Yeah, actually, and that that's actually a really important point that if you are recording consultations, you've got to store them and you've got to be able to release them to the patient if ever they ask for their records so again that's actually a really important thing to be aware of and have built into your system so if you are recording these things you must store them they must be uh, released to the patient if ever they request copies of their records yeah okay Leah, i've got a question here about um is it okay to speak with the relative instead of the patient um if you've got concerns about mental capacity um in, in those sort of circumstances? Yes, it is. Um, patients' best interests will come first. Um, if uh, it's more difficult to do the assessment of the capacity of a patient remotely, I think. Um, but um, the, the starting point with capacity to consent is that any anyone 16 or above, you assume they do have capacity to consent until you have proven that they don't so i think probably the starting point is that you assume the patient can consent and then you ask them to if you can involve other people and if they give you permission to do so that's great if they don't give you permission to involve other people you've then got to decide um, where you go from there and that can be a tricky situation so i think in those circumstances it's best to pause and give us a call um, and we can provide you with that advice over the advice line which is specific to that individual situation that you face yeah, um, because yeah. there's no hard and fast rules with that and just using our advice line please do call us um, and your subscriptions will not go up if you telephone the ddu uh, that is another internet myth that's out there um, I'm not blaming Donald Trump for that one, but um, it is definitely an internet myth. Yeah. Thanks, Leah. 
the Leo, the next question I've got it is around um, the sort of consent that, that I was um, talking about in my part of the presentation. And it's about um, in situations when patients may choose an option that's not in their best interests or could be detrimental to their longer term health and what the, the uh, professionals um, responsibilities are with regards to either performing what the what the patient is asking for or not undertaking a procedure if they genuinely don't think it's in in the patient's best interests the the answer to that is in theory dead straightforward but in practice is really difficult because the answer is you do not do something that you do not think is in the patient's best interest but the conversation with the patient can be very difficult in those circumstances. Um, the, uh, all of us um, who are on this presentation will have had calls, assisted members with situations where they say, I wish I hadn't done that. You know, I was persuaded into doing it against my better judgment. Um, and that's a horrible place to be when it does go wrong. So if you do not think it's in the patient's best interests, do not do it. Down tools, stop, don't do it. It can be really helpful to explain to a patient that there can be legitimate differences of opinion between clinicians and someone else might think it's an appropriate thing to do because they will go somewhere else and then you'll get that, oh, I've been down the road and someone else has said I can do this, you know. But um, so if you explain, first of all, that there can be these legitimate differences of opinion, that can go a long way and it can also help avoid a problem for a colleague who legitimately thinks it is an appropriate treatment plan uh, to follow. Um, so that little explanation can go a long way, but don't do something unless you personally think it's in the patient's best interests, even if the patient wants it. And they say, and if they say they're going to sign a disclaimer, run away from them fast, because they're not worth um, anything. In fact, they're positive proof that you're doing something that you don't think is appropriate. If you're saying I'm signing this or the patient signs it saying, I know I shouldn't be having this done, but I want it done. So I'm signing, uh, removing the rights of the dentist to any responsibility because it doesn't remove your rights, to your responsibility. So just don't do it. I think the other part of that question as well, and, and probably quite relevant and interesting in the pandemic is about patients not having treatment that that you're recommending and obviously I spoke about consent and that because it's a, the patient's decision ultimately it's the patient that that can make that potentially bad decision as well yeah, yeah. as as patients were allowed to be silly as professionals we're not basically so patients can make bad decisions um but what's important is that they're aware of the consequences of making that bad decision. So have that really good discussion with the patient, make sure that they understand what might go horribly wrong if they do or don't follow a certain course of action. In my experience, it's usually someone who decides they're not gonna have something done because it's probably a little bit unpleasant and they're putting it off, they're putting it off, they're putting it off. They need to be aware of the consequences of putting off, putting off, putting off. Um, so make sure that you discuss that carefully with them, make sure they fully understand and document that discussion because the trouble is when the inevitable happens, they'll forget that they had that discussion with you and <clears throat> blame you for it. So yeah, they can they are allowed to make unwise decisions. Um, that is a patient's choice ultimately. You cannot do anything unless the patient consents to it. Yeah. Okay, Leo, I've got a question here about um, encrypted patient identifiable information. Is it okay to store it on your home PC if you're a data processor? No, basically, um, it should not be stored on your own device um, because then you are likely to be a data controller. Um, so make sure that the systems you have, you can store the information on practice um, or your workplace systems. Um, so make sure that that happens. Um, there may be ways of using your own computer for accessing information, but make sure it's stored on 
the practice um, database, not on your personal um, computer. And that that goes with face-to-face um, -face consultations as well. You know, don't take photos of a patient using your own phone. Um, do you know what happens to that? Can you ever delete it? Is it automatically uploaded onto a cloud? I haven't got a clue with my phone. It could be doing all these things. I don't know. Um, so, um, you know, if you are taking patient photos doing that sort of thing, um, that might mean that you're you are using your personal device, you become a data controller. So basically always use the practice or the workplace systems um, for anything like that. Yeah. I think there's time for one more question. I've got one actually, just a quick one. Um, is it okay to have a verbal medical history um, taken over the phone? Can you rely on that if the patient hasn't signed the form in the usual way? Absolutely yes. Um, it's not a problem at all. I, I've I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about um, medical histories anyway, because every part of the history we um, take ourselves and we write it in the records that we've taken that bit of the history and record it. It's absolutely fine. Why we're not allowed to do that in normal times with the medical history, I don't know, and nobody's ever been able to give me a straightforward answer. The trouble is all the guidance says you need a written medical history filled out by the patient and signed by the patient, so stick with the guidance, although it's frustrating because the guidance to me doesn't make sense. Um, okay. So, but during this pandemic, yeah, absolutely fine for forms to be signed on behalf of the patient. NHS have made it clear that you can do that. You don't want patients um, coming in, signing forms, using practice pens, all of those things. Um, who knows what will happen in the future? Maybe what we're doing now will become um, standard practice in the future. I don't know. We've just got to wait and see what happens. But yeah, absolutely fine. All right, thank you. But but the important thing is make sure that you gather that information correctly, accurately anyway. Um, so make sure that you ask the right questions in a way that the patient can understand and you get accurate information back. Yeah. Um, so um, I think that is probably it now. Um, we yeah two minutes short of the hour. So um, we've actually finished well on time, um, which I think is um, quite good going. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who's joined for joining. I'd like to also thank Alison and Sarah for being my co-conspirators tonight. Thank Thanks, you. Leah.